Next up, uh, we have someone who's been working on some out-of-the-box applications in the field of IoT. He's been working on uh, animal trackers. He's been working on uh, setting up network in some of the most remote areas in the world. And today, he's going to be talking about tracking green sea turtles in the Amazon forest of Peru. Please give a big round of applause for Luca. Good morning, everyone. So today, I'll be talking about drone-assisted TTN network deployments and really understanding what our gateways devices do in some very remote areas. So I'm currently a Shuttleworth Foundation uh, fellow, which allows me to do some really cool things. Uh, a lot of what you have seen here uh, and will see today is uh, sponsored by them. Currently, I'm based in uh, Slovenia and run two organizations, uh, Institute Irnas, where we do lots of research and development, and a manufacturing company where we put these ideas into practice. So um, my work is split between a number of areas. Um, namely, one of the key ones is wireless optical communications, um, sending gigabit or 10 gigabits of data between buildings with a beam of light. Um, IoT devices for specialized use cases, such as the things I will introduce today. Uh, 3D bioprinting uh, for vascularized hydrogel structures and low-cost medical devices for the whole world. So today I'll be introducing a number of projects we work with uh, with our partners from Aribada Initiative uh, in the UK on open sourcing the conservation technology. And if you think about why we need to do this, on one hand, we need to understand how animals behave, where do they live, what do they eat, um, and how we make sure they can prosper. But more importantly, we can think of animals as the sensors. Because by observing the animals, their behavior, we can understand what's happening in the environment directly. So for example, penguins, if we see changes in their migration, we can better understand climate uh, change and changes in Antarctica, for example. Um, if we see how sea turtles swim around, the way they feed, we can affect the policy to conserve them by, say, moving a port or changing the shipping routes or things like that. And a number of use cases we've worked on this past year um, include building devices for such applications. Um, we have, say, the PMP device, which is a penguin monitoring platform. Essentially, it's a camera that's points at penguins, and you can count the number that's nesting in an area. The FMP device is a freshwater monitoring system, which is designed to measure the water level and take snapshots, so we can pretty much have a time lapse, but with a purpose to get real-time notifications when there's a drought in a river with some very endangered fish, and they can be saved, but actually someone going there and putting them in a bucket and then in a pond. Or, for example, in a jungle in Peru, understanding how animals move from one tree to the other and get that data in real time. A lot of solutions out there currently are, firstly, closed source, which do not allow for additional developments, do not allow for edge computing and plenty of exciting things, as well as they are not very well suited for the final application. So, the video you've seen um, a few moments ago is from Aribada turtle uh, tags. We've deployed in December in Principe. So the green sea turtles are one of the very endangered animals. And their cycle is that about every two years, they return to a beach where they will uh, come to the beach, dig a nest, lay some eggs, swim around the island for about two weeks, return to that beach, and they repeat that cycle for about four or five times. And that is an excellent opportunity to enhance that animal with a camera and a tracker to understand how it moves around the island and understand what eats, which other animals does it meet, and what happens there. So we've developed this camera, uh, which um, 
actually has a Raspberry Pi Zero W in there, a power management board we developed, um, a LoRa radio, a Raspberry Pi camera, and a battery in a highly durable enclosure. And the purpose of this is that we record about 20 hours of video over the course of two weeks in, say, 10 minutes an hour, five minutes an hour. Um, and when the animal comes back to the beach, we retrieve the camera, download the images. Now the question is, where does LoRa and wireless comms come into this? Firstly, it's nice to know that the animal has returned to the beach so it can go pick up the camera and get all the 88 gigs of video. And secondly, if it comes to the surface at some point, we can know, okay, currently it's in this area. And you can also very coarsely, like even base station to base station, just track where the animals are. Um, the same application in a bit different form was done in Peru, where again, a Raspberry Pi and a camera is the basis for the system. But here we want to have motion triggered actions. So say a monkey climbs up the tree, we will first take a snapshot and then record a short video. Um, and how is this different to say normal like Bushnell cameras, which um, you just put there and they will record some videos, is that you have no real time feedback. You don't know what's happening in the environment immediately, but you just find that out when you retrieve the device a year later or at any point. Um, and the same goes just in a different uh, form for saving fish. Um, you need to know when the water level changes, get the notification immediately so you can do some action. And we take, say, snapshots uh, of uh, the river, but you don't need those snapshots and images, which are huge files to transmit in real time. You can just check back for a year and see how the river changed to the point where you got the alarm and you had to do some action to save animals. Um, and the construction of the device is, again, very similar. Raspberry Pi is the core, power scheduling, solar charging. In this one, um, there's an Iridium satellite modem because this is very remote and there's no connectivity there. So we are very much looking forward uh, to LoRa 1 from space and the opportunities that will open up. Um, and likewise for Antarctica. Currently, the research there is done. You take a camera, you put it there, you go there with a boat, takes about a week, um, and come back a year later, get the camera, and retrieve the images. It would be nice if we can actually implement edge processing. So, you know, you use OpenCV, roughly count the penguins, and just send that information. You can always post-process the images once you retrieve the actual SD card. But having real-time data is simply Every year in the past, say, 50 years, there was a thousand penguins here. Now there's three. Likely something odd is going on. And those things are what we want to see in real time. Um, the core of what we developed, and it's common to all of these applications, and also cultivates the open uh, development process, is something we call Piera Zero, which is essentially a power scheduling board, which will turn on the Pi, um, has a LoRa chip on it, and a few other bits and pieces. The interesting story here to tell, uh, for those of you who've been here yesterday and have seen the SolarCast uh, device and presentation from Peter about the SafeCast project, um, is how the story uh, of the Pira power board started. Um, a good year ago, uh, with developing SolarCast, we made a nice universal power scheduling board, version one. With all the projects that came in, then each project contributed a bit of development, and that piece of electronics was improved from project to project, so now we have an even more optimal solution, and we can very rapidly integrate that into any kind of a project. And by looking at all of those applications and examples, we can actually learn and figure out what our technology needs to do. What's the actual use case on the ground, driving 24 hours into the jungle, then going to a boat and having a 128 kilobit internet connection for an hour a day. Um, and you really see what the reality is on the ground and then understand what the technology needs to do. And first and most important part for enabling people, researchers, and pretty much anyone to deploy systems like this is they need to be simple, low cost, and suitable for untrained use which means pretty much zero config, or the config needs to be as simple as using Facebook, because really everyone knows how to use Facebook on their phone. So if we deliver the same kind of user experience to say, you know, open up the app, 
say through BLE or Wi-Fi, opening a web page, it's simple and everyone can click a few buttons there. Um, and the most important thing they need to know about, say a camera you put somewhere in the bush, is not necessarily the photos, it's just does it work? Because if it stops working, you need to go there and fix it. Um, for photos, you can kind of wait a bit or you can implement something smarter and receive that real-time information in just a few bytes, not sending huge amounts of data. Um, and the question is of network mapping. Here, how do we actually deploy something in the field so we know it will connect, and how do we know where to put the gateways? Um, in the presentation Tim had yesterday for the Internet of Life, you might have seen quite some interesting examples how they built this huge 30-meter towers on top of very tall hills um, in Africa to get a very nice coverage of a large area of a national park to be able to track animals. Um, in a lot of cases we work with is you don't have the luxury even to invest and put up a tower or it's in a location where you simply can't do that. So the coverage is very limited because your highest point is usually a tree and you can't do much better than that. Um, and the bigger part of the understanding um, we tried to gather through all the experiments and the drone mapping was how do we get that coverage? And LoRa and LoRa1 enables us uh, to have a really large link budget so we can operate in very suboptimal conditions. And over the past two days, we've heard about you know, transmissions from shipping containers and various kinds of suboptimal conditions or you know, basements for uh, mouse traps and things like that, and it works. So it's very optimal for a use case like this. Um, we approach this from the very low cost end um, perspective, usually also because there's a lot, like, relatively small number of devices. Um, so you don't need super high end gateways, just need the radio budget really. Um, so we use the SX module as pretty much um, almost everyone at this point. Um, we use simple gateways, currently Raspberry Pi Zero and Rock A3 uh, one boards. Um, uplinks are really anything we can find, um, 3G, 4G, Wi-Fi, um, and usually it's even solar powered or you just run a very long PoE cable. But the benefit that the Things Network brought to us is it's simple to deploy. Like if you get some basic connectivity, you can just send the data and you don't need to run any backend. And for like small specialized projects, you really don't want to run too many things. Um, and from just running a successful network, what are the technical unknowns? So we, we go here a bit deeper in technology. Um, you might all know TTN Mapper. Um, JP developed this awesome thing where uh, you can just get a Mapper node, um, which is a device, something like this. Um, and he's, here's a call to you all. If you have a TTN Mapper uh, with you, please turn it on. Today we're trying to break the record of number of connected mappers in a single location. So yeah, grab your bag and turn it on. Um, and with this, you've seen maps of coverage like cities, Amsterdam, and you can roughly know how, what your gateway does. And when you deploy a gateway, you really want to know what your gateway does, not just put there and hope it kind of works. Um, so, but just going around with a car or on foot on large remote areas, likely with no roads or no footpaths even, it's not exactly feasible nor is your application always in that place. Because if you're putting things up a tree, you're not interested in ground coverage. You're interested in what's the coverage at a tree level, which can be 50 meters high. Um, and you know the forest is very uneven, so like a tall tree somewhere might not have coverage, whereas a very short tree might have coverage at a different location. Um, and lots of like modeling uh, solutions, say radio mobile or pretty much any other softwares, have some land cover options, but they won't give you that real result that it will say, if I put my gateway 50 meters up a tree and that tree next to it grows in a year for another meter, what happens and all of those things. Um, so essentially our goal is to understand, do we have coverage everywhere where we need to or how do we check this, say tweak the gateway, move the gateway, and understand how the coverage changes in those cases. So we've developed this quite simple mapping setup, which is um, in the offline um, configuration using TTN Mapper. So if your gateways are connected to the internet, you can simply just 
uh, send uh, all the information there. Um, the offline option is also under development. We have a few prototypes running uh, where you do mapping device to device, which means that you can real-time plot data to, say, Google Earth and just see as you fly the drone around what the coverage uh, is. Um, so currently, what we use for the drone is this. There, it has a, two Velcro mounts, and you essentially just put it on a drone like this. Um, it's a normal DJI drone, should work with any drone. Um, you just put a mapper on it, uh, essentially, um, and you make it transmit data as often as possible, really. Um, then you fly the drone um, with an app, for example, Litchi, or pretty much any app that allows you to do pre-planned mission. You really want to have a flight path which is saved and repeatable, because you might want to fly it several times and check what your changes did. Um, after that, you acquire the data from, say, TTN Mapper, um, process it, and display it in Google Earth or anywhere else. Um, so this simple example um, of a field in Slovenia for uh, the sake of the presentation is um, we've taken the drone, flown it in a pattern you see uh, shown here on the yellow line, um, and the Mapper transmitted signal, well, packets, and from that we got the signal strength and the allocation um, all around this path. Um, now, this is quite useful, um, assuming that in the center we have a gateway, and this was a gateway placed on a car. Um, so from this information, you can roughly see, OK, I have coverage and how the coverage behaves. But it goes much further than this. You can deduce the radiation patterns of your gateway. So some of you might have seen a presentation about antenna radiations and how, you know, LoRa antennas can be optimized for different use cases. Um, and you get some radiation diagram there on the like, perspective of the antenna. But for all deployments, we are directly interested in what is the coverage from antenna to antenna. So if I take my gateway, whatever that gateway is, I put it on a tree or a pole, and that pole changes the radiation diagram, and I put my device with usually not the optimal antenna, say one meter above the ground, five meters on top of a tree, what happens in that case? And what's the real world coverage? Um, so the experiment here, um, the three images show um, coverage mapping 50 meters above ground around the gateway in a field. So this is like a kilometer by kilometer uh, scan. Uh, 25 meters above ground and two meters above ground. Um, and you, from this, you can see that the radiation pattern it's not really optimal because the power um, from the antenna or the mapper seems to be going upwards. You see there's a large center uh, in the middle and quite a steep drop of uh, signal strength as we go um, away from the gateway. So um, we did some tests. Obviously, first you take just some random antenna you have lying around and do a test, see what happens. And then we used a bit better antenna. So rated um, you know, good quality 3db uh, antennas um, on the right, as you can see. And we did the comparative test between the two. And you can see the difference. Um, first image here um, is the coverage um, from the better antenna, so 3db um, omni antenna. And you can see what you really wish to see, a radiation pattern like um, there on top, where just above the gateway, you don't have anything radiating or being received from the top, because usually your nodes are not above the gateway. And you really want to focus all of the radiated power um, away from, like, in a useful direction. And so first is coverage uh, if you have two omni antennas, one of the gateway, one of the mapper. The second case is using one of the small antennas, which are actually uh, helical antennas. Uh, in most cases, and in the axial mode, they will have a radiation pattern of something like you see here. So the majority of the antenna power, the majority of energy you're emitting from your node with that antenna, which you might point upwards because that seems kind of intuitive, it's actually going upwards. So unless you're sending it to a satellite, this is suboptimal, as you can see here. Um, and the coverage difference uh, between the red, say, minus 40 uh, in DBM, 
um, receive area compared to like yellow, green, minus 70. It's a 30 dB difference uh, in real world example. And by doing an automated test, we can swap antennas and repeat the same test, not in a, you know, a quiet room or in some high tech facility, but in real world environment where the device actually is. Um, and also, like, how does the environment affect the coverage um, of our gateway? So, here's an example um, from Slovenia for um, this demonstration. We have our TTN gateway, as you can see on the right. Um, it's a collinear antenna, um, Raspberry Pi and an IMBS board, about 1,000 meters um, above ground on a mountain, and it covers a large area up to, say, 50 kilometers. Um, from this case, it's like 10 kilometers uh, from where this photo was taken. Um, but you know, it's relatively low on the horizon. So the forest there, say you're putting nodes and cameras on the edge of the field, because you normally don't want it in the middle of the field in this case, might not have good coverage. And the example here I'm showing uh, is the blue part is coverage from the gateway that's 10 kilometers away. Um, they much higher coverage. Um, red, green, and yellow is from the gateway that was placed on my car, which was parked exactly on the spot, um, as you would imagine. Um, and you can see how big the shadow from the forest is. So you know you can't place devices there. So if you, your use case is of that sort, you can do a number of things. Either try a number of different antennas, run around your perimeter where you're deploying it, or fly the drone around and see what happens. Um, you might need to put another gateway or just change your configuration slightly. But it's good that you can repeatedly get good quality information on what's actually happening in practice. Um, so this is just showing the same data for the same field, but just abstracted. And you can see a very even coverage from a very remote gateway and, well, a rather uneven coverage, um, which you would expect to be kind of radial from the car, but because it's not a perfect ground plane, um, you know, it's slightly tilted, all of those things. You can see a number of things going on and possibly, like you can't see it on the slide here, but if you check the slides online as they're posted in the Slack already, there's a slightly lighter blue area close to where the car was parked. Like to do some reflections or just be a large metallic optic, uh, object in the area. And that also allows you to do tests and understand what happens. Um, and for example, if you compare this to, say, Radio Mobile, which is the coverage planning software, it will just say, oh, this is all covered. Just put a the note there and it should work. Well, not exactly the case uh, in most deployments. So how does this apply to a very remote area and in what we can use it uh, for there? So in the forest in uh, Peru, where we have cameras on tops of the trees, um, those cameras send high-speed data, images, videos, back through Wi-Fi. And getting Wi-Fi coverage from one tree to the other tree on a very uneven surface is very difficult. It might be possible in some cases, and it is possible. Um, but we really want to turn that on because it uses a lot of power only maybe once a week, or actually, we want to turn it on when we have some uh, interesting data. But we, in real time, want to know that the devices are working properly. The battery level, just like how many videos it took. And we can use LoRa in that case to cover a much wider area, have real-time status, and say we use two drones, you can put one device, just fly it up to a tree which you think you can mount something on and can be a good base station location, fly the other one around and see the coverage from that, move it again and just experimentally verify what's the optimal solution because there is no good planning option. It's all experience, just on-site assessment. And because it's very expensive going there, you want also there to be the minimum amount of time, so you need to do things quickly and efficiently. And this has proven to be a very, very good method. And finally, an example on Principe Island, where we are doing the green sea turtle monitoring. Um, pretty much, it's a small island, a few thousand people live on it, it's a small city, um, there are three cell phone towers with 3G, um, and the island has a microwave uplink of total capacity, I believe, 300 megabits um, for the whole island. Um, so connectivity is possible, but it's somewhat limited. Um, so to start with, uh, we put up a gateway on a VHF radio pole 
um, in the city where there's internet and power, um, because that's the first logical step. And that get, gets us this coverage, so about the uh, green pattern you see. But in the red circle, you see a nice beach, and that's the beach where turtles will end up. So if the turtle comes back to the beach, we have no coverage there. Um, so it's finding out and optimizing how do we, say, find a location with 3G where we can put a gateway with enough sun um, so it has the desired coverage. And say, going around a sandy beach or even like surface of a bay just across water, it's only really feasible with a drone if you want to do it fast and quickly and change things around. So that's exactly what we're doing here in the next steps. Um, so as you've heard probably a number of like small snippets of experience from the field, but just joining them in like a short narrative here. Usually for such applications, base station height is limited. Tallest tree, as close as possible to the power source is your best friend usually. And about 100 meters of PoE cable, maybe 200 meters still works in some applications. Um, Wi-Fi or 3G, those things are very improbable. Um, some satellite connection might be present in some case, but also it's important to keep in mind that 3G coverage is penetrating in, in very remote areas, and at some point we will have it uh, there. There's also a non-technical issue of health and safety, um, because organizations won't just allow you to get, go there and climb the trees and do whatever you need to um, actually deploy the system. You need a, someone who is specifically trained from their organization for the specific country to do so. So you can't just climb trees and try things out and find the best solution. You want to minimize that time and the effort, and that's exactly why we use the drone again, because you fly through a canopy, you put it like a meter away from where you will mount it on a tree, see what happens, verify it works, and that's all you have to do. So this is time-effective deployment. So minimizing the time, minimizing the extra personnel you need, and also um, to really get the best connectivity possible at the lowest uh, price. And price in such specialized deployments is usually development and on-site support. It's not the device, devices themselves or the hardware itself. Um, it's just a large effort to go somewhere very, very remote. Um, so currently, things we're working on um, everything we do in this field is open source, and you can also find on our GitHub, um, is setting up uh, solar-powered gateways and testing out the best configuration for that. Um, take, building a new generation of our power scheduling system, which will include also BLE, LoRa, and can just turn on your Pi, say, uh, once an hour or twice an hour, as pretty much uh, you need it, or even doing that adaptively. So being smart, here's how much power we got yesterday, we can use the same amount of power today, or something along the lines. Um, and even having the ability to switch operation through say, oh, there was, I don't know, an earthquake, I want photo every minute, but you can input that information through LoRa. You can't go on the site and have someone switch every box to a different schedule uh, locally. Um, there's a bit more work on the offline drone mapping and a lot of work on the customizable devices. Um, and we have this process where we go through the development of all of this custom things. So if you actually need that, feel free to get in touch. Otherwise, I would like to open up the floor for uh, questions. Um, slides are on Slack, so feel free to look at them or you know, just get in touch. Thank you, Luca. This was really a cool project and something which we as a community also need to address this conservation uh, using technology. Uh, my question to you would be uh, something on the community side. Uh, this is really inspiring as well. And what do you see as a challenge uh, in building up a community or addressing these issues? So um, an interesting challenge we have on the Principi Island and how to actually put out the conservation technology such that it's locally sustainable is um, is that our, our Ibarra uh, initiative partners have a local education program where uh, they teach the kids how, say, the turtle tracker works. So they take one apart, they look at the technology, they play with scratch, uh, and this is really to get, firstly, a lot of outside knowledge into a local community which is very much deprived of the new technology advancements. Um, and, for example, with the network we're building there to 
do the real application of tracking sea turtles. Mm -hmm. We're essentially building a local community there and motivating kids to start playing with this technology and say, you know, put a LoRa transmitter on their goat and follow it for um, uh, three days. And like, likely all of those kids actually have a goat. So it's something they would be interested in doing. Um, and this gives a good potential for them to actually become a part of a worldwide community for a region where there's not much opportunity to actually learn and play with cool technology. Excellent, excellent. Anyone else uh, from the uh, audio? Oh, sorry. Hi, Luca. Thank you very much for the great presentation. It's amazing. Um, so first, do you also sell the devices? Um, or is you just open hardware it and then people can do it themselves? Or yeah, so we manufacture and sell devices. Um, for most applications, because these are specialized devices, they are custom built and usually some development needs to be done for this specific application. Okay, cool. Um, but say if you know, a bunch of you wants devices, we can just build a batch for you, really. Cool, great. And what about, the, you said the power management, I'm quite interested in that, because the Raspberry Pi Zero still uses quite a bit of power. So it's only up for like really short times, or how long is that? Exactly. So um, I can show the device I have here. Um, feel free to come look closer later on. So uh, the device is Pi Zero with our power management, uh, six standard 18650 cells in here. Um, so for, say, taking photos in Antarctica, um, the device will boot, take a photo, send LoRa messages, or do whatever within about um, 29 seconds. So that, that's the boot cycle. And with the power consumption, that's about half a milliamp hour per photo. Um, so that's about 20,000 photos with just one charge of the whole device. Um, and over a year, that's pretty much enough photos uh, for everything you do. With some solar panels, you have plenty of power. And in Antarctica, what about the very cool climate? Uh is that yeah. the, the batteries? Is that a challenge? That is a challenge, which, say in this example, because batteries are like incredibly overdimensioned, uh, is that you're discharging them at such a slow rate that the temperature effect on the internal uh, impedance is sufficiently small that you don't lose as much as, say, if you were running a phone or uh, an electric bike, which has a huge current spike, and there the internal resistance will... Um, make quite a lot of problems. So this is kind of uh, making things better. But say to about minus 20, minus 30 degrees, which most of Antarctica is, ex except the um, inner circle, really, um, this works just fine without any problems. Any other question for Luca? Oh. Could you introduce yourself? Hi, Luca. Hello. Steve from Milan. Uh, did you consider how the gateway and its antenna uh, was influenced by uh, the drone and all of its equipment compared to the same gateway sitting on a quiet uh, location? Um, so we've done some tests and have not seen that significant of a difference. Um, so if your antenna does not require a large ground plane, you can do this. But also note that even if you put it on a tree, it's not exactly a good ground plane. So um, it doesn't make that big of a difference in those cases. Um, so it, it's very good to do some testing, but uh, we've not seen that significant of a difference. Or you know, more significant was which antenna you chosen, how you've rotated it, all of those things, than such uh, minimal differences. But do, I do agree for investigation on this front can be done if there's a need for it. Anyone else? Yeah. Introduce yourself. Hi, Luca. Just a question. Uh, what speed was the drone in order to get the data and the GPS information like accurate? Another um, question is okay. how you make to do this uh, 3D a graph of the radiation pattern. Right, so um, firstly, the speed of the drone really um, depends on what you're trying to do. Uh, normally, we fly at about 35 kilometers an hour, um, just because this is one of the reasonably optimal things 
for the drone, so you get maximal range at about that speed. So if you try to do, say, 50 kilometers an hour with it, it is um, very power hungry. Um, if you want more granular data, you just simply fly a bit uh, slower so you get more data points. Um, but essentially, the, the benefit of doing this comes with covering large distances. You really want to go, say, around the gateway, you want to go around for a kilometer or something like that to see the gradient as it happens. And you want to do that at different heights so we can get a sense of what happens. Now, the mapping and um, just plotting this data, um, it's done in Python simply uh, with matplotlib. Um, so we import the data, you match it to a grid, um, and then you do a heat map or you do a 3D pattern. Now, if you stack multiple layers at different heights, uh, you can get pretty good 3D impression of what's happening in, the, you know, in that situation. Um, so one of the options is you can take the drone around your static, uh, say, gateway and just map how it radiates. Say, you have a chimney which will block part of the uh, pattern or something like that. Well, thanks a lot, Luca, for sharing your story. And well, for the rest much. of you, you can uh, always find him on Slack. He's really active. If you have any other queries, uh, feel free to reach out to him. Thanks Perfect. a lot, Luca. Thank you very much. Thank you.